I'll repeat questions uh, from the audience. Understand, understand. Okay, I will. Uh, I will try to remember to repeat questions uh, if they come, and you're certainly welcome to ask questions as we go along. So, first of all, thank you everyone for coming here today. Um, my name is David A. Wheeler, and I'm here to give my uh, public defense of my dissertation, fully countering trust and trust through the diverse double compiling. These slides and the dissertation itself are actually available online uh, at uh, www.dwheeler.com slash trusting dash trust. And with that, we'll begin. My outline is actually pretty simple. It is essentially, my outline for my presentation is the same as the outline for the dissertation itself. I've got a little extra background material because I'm thinking that some of the uh, you people may not have some of the background that I assume for the dissertation itself. But other than that, it's essentially the same as the dissertation. And basically, what I'm going to be trying to demonstrate in this whole presentation before I go into the details is there's an attack called the trusting trust attack. It's a computer-based attack. And historically, it's been considered essentially uncounterable. There are, there are not very effective techniques for countering this attack. I believe I have a countermeasure called diverse double compiling, and I have my dissertation involves describing it, showing that it works, and demonstrating it. With that, we'll move on. So let me start a little further back here. Let me start with the ENIAC, which is operational in July 1946. This is a picture of only part of the ENIAC here. It's widely considered to be the first general purpose electronic computer. Uh, the challenge with the ENIAC was that it was programmed by patch tables and switches see these wires here. This is how you would program the ENIAC. Incredibly painful to program. It would take days to change to a different program. This is a picture of the Manchester Small Scale Experimental Machine, often nicknamed Baby. That's what I'm going to call it here. Uh, it was operational in June 1948. And this is considered to be the first stored program computer. A stored program computer is where the memory, where memory is used both for programs and for data. And this was a major step forward in computing. For one thing, you could easily reload programs. Instead of having to take days to rewire, you could just load a program the same way you would load data. Even more intriguingly, a computer could generate computer programs, which leads me to the need to define some terms. First of all, some data inside a computer program can be executed. You can, it's a program, and you can run it. And we're going to call those executables, which are simply data that can be directly executed by some computing environment. It could be a real one, could be a virtual one. Uh, sometimes these things are called binaries. But these are rather painful to work with directly. So typically, when people write programs, they write, use, uh, write programs as source code. Source code is also data. But source code is some representation of a program that can be translated somehow into an executable. Now this implies that I'm going to need some way of translating source code into executables. And that's what compilers are for. Compilers are simply programs, or executables, that translate source code into an executable that a computer can actually use. Now a compiler may have other inputs, but the fundamental issue I want to point out here is source code input producing executables output. Now this has, compilers are great, very, very helpful, however, uh, when they ease development, uh, they also in introduce some risks that were only revealed later. I should note, by the way, that I'm trying, I'm defining compiler very, very broadly. As long as it translates source code into executable, it's a compiler. If it's mostly a one-to-one -one relationship, many people call that kind of compiler an assembler. As far as I'm concerned, it's a compiler. It may do many other things. Doesn't matter. As long as it does, as at least one of its jobs, translation source to executable, it's a compiler. Now, what is this risk that I alluded to? Well, let me move towards that by first defining some additional terms. Let me define the term corrupted executable. Corrupted executable is an executable that does not correspond to the source code it's supposed to correspond. Remember, if you're translating source to executable, well, that, for some reason, that may, translation may not be entirely accurate. And this is a, a more technical term, term here which defines what the heck I mean by corresponds. Um, I'll just read this. An executable E corresponds to source code S if and only if the execution of E always behaves as specified by source code S when the execution environment E behaves correctly. Technical definition, but fundamentally, 
this just defines more precisely what we would meet uh, intended uh, by intuition. What's a maliciously corrupt executable? A maliciously corrupt executable is a corrupt executable that was intentionally created. And intent is uh, an important point here, and I'll come back to that later. Now, all right, we could have corrupted executables, but we could find them just by recompiling and checking if the resulting executable was the same, right? And if it's changed somehow, then I've got a problem. Well, unfortunately, that's not always true. And this starts to lead us to something called the trusting trust attack. What happens if the compiler itself is maliciously corrupted? And now we have all sorts of problems because we're tr we are using the compiler to translate source code into the executables, but executables are the only thing the computer actually can execute. So what the human sees and what the computer actually executes could be different. In general, you could have completely trustworthy source code and end up with corrupted, maliciously corrupted executables if the compiler itself is maliciously corrupted. For example, I could have some really critical, important program. It might be the login program for a computer. It might be a control system for a dam. But it could be really important. I run through the critical program, and now it does something different. Something the malicious, some, whoever created this maliciously corrupted uh, compiler in the first place could make it do, in theory, anything. But that's, you could say, well, okay, I'll just analyze the resulting executables. Well, where do those analyzers come from? Well, somebody had to write that analysis program, and then you ended up compiling it. And this means that, in fact, what the analysis program shows you may not be what you actually intended for it to be. But it gets worse. And here's the real nasty part of the trust and trust attack. Um, how do you create compilers? Well, the short answer is you have a compiler source, you run through a compiler, you produce the executable. Now, wait a minute. The compiler can corrupt itself. This is especially disastrous. And you can end up with a situation where it perpetuates, where the compiler corrupts itself and future versions of itself. This was first noted in 1974 in a security evaluation by Parker and Shell. This is actually the evaluation of the Multics operating system. And they were actually rather coy in how they described it. And I talked with Carter in 2005 about why they did that. Basically, most of the other attacks that they, could, that they found, in fact, all the other attacks they could found, find, uh, they could see how to deal with them. You know, there, in, in implementation error, you need to get it fixed. This is a problem with the design. We need to tweak or change the design a little bit. But when they identified this attack, they couldn't figure out how to counter this one. This was very, very fundamental. In 1984, Ken Thompson, who's also the developer of, of Unix, actually demonstrated this attack. He actually subverted the login program, the symbolic debugger, and in his case, the C compiler, and demonstrated that indeed you could do this. And what's more, he sent it to another group inside Bell Labs, and they never detected this particular attack. Now he has he has said, and I have every reason to believe him, that it never went outside the real, into the outside world. Um, but the fact that this was done and handed off to another group which, who never found it suggests that this is not just you know, something that might, that might that could never really happen. It's, somebody's already done this. You know, good guy in this case, but nevertheless, this is clearly a possible attack. This is a fundamental security problem. Now, I'm going to, here's a technical definition of the trust and trust attack. Again, I'm just going to read it off. What's a trust and trust attack? An attack in which the attacker attempts to disseminate a compiler executable that produces a corrupted executable. At least one of those corrupt executables is a corrupt compiler, and the attacker tries to make this self perpetuate So, now, so many, some people have said, well, gee, there are lots of other attacks. Why worry about this one? Well, it's certainly true that there are lots of other attacks. Um, and I don't mean to say that those other attacks are unimportant. They are very important. However, as I hinted at earlier, if, we, if you list out the different kinds of attacks, we generally have countermeasures for those other attacks. And let me just point out a few. You know, certainly what happens often today when people attack computers is they find and exploit unintentional weaknesses in some existing program. Certainly that's a problem, certainly. But we do know how to at least start countering that. We search for weaknesses ourselves and fix the problem before they go out in the field. Uh, modified designs to reduce impact and so on. Um, perhaps the attacker will insert weaknesses or attacks into the program code itself. Well, that's certainly a possibility, but you can have other people review the source code and uh, hopefully find that problem. 
Uh, you could modify and replace the executable, but not use the trusting trust attack. Well, we could regenerate the executable and compare. But when we say, well, what about applying the trusting trust attack? There really hasn't been an effective defense, and that's what makes this problem important, is that there hasn't been an effective uh, detection or countermeasure. Uh, which leads me to this. You know, why is this important? It's the attack that can't be countered. And it's not just that people think this is so, but people have tried for decades. This has been known about for decades. Not much has been written, and what's there hasn't been really very effective. I've even got a citation in my paper where somebody says, well, computer security is hopeless. It's, even if I counter all the ones we know how to counter, here's one we can't counter. Um, and I believe that attackers are going to have incentive to use this at some point if it's uncounterable. Uh, we have potentially huge benefits. If you can control the compiler, you can control all the software that runs through it, that's compiled with it. Uh, the risks seem to be low, at least until now, undetectable. And the costs seem to be varying, but in many cases low to medium. Uh, granted, that varies by circumstance, but even if it's high, if the benefits are high enough and the risks are low enough, I think it's reasonably that someday somebody's going to try it. Um, in fact, in this year, there's already been one example of a subverted compiler. You can argue some things about it, but you there are, and, and of course, in 1984, Ken Thompson did it. So it's not that it can't be done or it's too hard to ever do in practice. That's not true. All right. I'm, I'm starting to wind up my background, but I do want to introduce a few more related background issues. Um, first of all, simple solutions are ineffective. A lot of people, when they first hear about this attack, they say, well, gee, it can't be that hard to counter. I'll just do this. Oh, wait a minute, that doesn't work out. And if you, do, if you have that kind of mental process, you're like a lot of other people. A lot of other people, when they first hear about this, say, oh, it's got to be counterable. And the easy solutions don't tend to work. Manual analysis, even if you move it to a completely different system and you're not worried about the analysis systems being subverted, the size of modern compilers makes it very, very hard um, to manually analyze executables of, of serious scale. Uh, some people say, well, I'll just use an interpreted language. That just moves the attack position. Because an interpreted language has to be implemented by something. And sooner or later, you have to get down to a place where it's implemented by an executable running on a computing environment. Almost certainly, that's going to be compiled, and you bring your right back to the trust and trust attack. Draper and McDermott in 1984 have probably the closest to countermeasures for this, for this thing. Um, they talk about using paraphrase compilers. Uh, the, the trouble with this is that there really isn't any way to know if their technique actually succeeded. And depending on how you apply it, you can actually insert the attack instead of removing it, uh, depending on how, which compiler you use and so on and so forth. Uh, and so really, these aren't very effective. Now, you could prove a compiler's executable is completely correct. And I certainly would encourage that kind of research. That's very neat. There has been some work in that area. I see some shaking heads. It's very hard. It's very hard. And then you have to ask questions, gee, what about my tools? Uh, the tools to do proofs uh, at any serious scale start to get a lot more com complex, sorry, complex than a lot of compilers. So I, I would encourage analysis and research in compiler correctness, but frankly, what I've, uh, the technique I'm going to describe works well with those if those become effective. All right, the compiler bootstrap test. Um, the compiler bootstrap test is a common test for detecting compiler errors. I won't make it clear that the compiler bootstrap test is not the same as the DDC technique that I'm going to be describing. But there is some relationship to it. It's sort of an inspiration for it. Um, it's formally described in Garrett 1999. It's, of course, been known much, much longer than that. Um, the text down here is a long amount of text. But let me just, this is shown graphically with this little picture. The idea is you start with some bootstrap compiler and some source code S of another compiler, well, possibly another compiler. And then compile it three times. And assuming certain conditions are true, the results of the second and third compilations are supposed to be equal. If they're not equal, then some assumption is wrong. And usually the assumption that's wrong is the source code was right in the first place. So this is a useful test of whether or not a compiler is correct. Okay? A correct compiler should pass this test. However, an incorrect compiler can also pass this test. And in particular, uh, corrupted compilers, you know, maliciously corrupted compilers even, can pass this test. So this is not a test to counter the trust and trust attack. But it's useful for other purposes and as an inspiration for the technique I'm going to describe. All right. 
I have a lot of additional background here, hopefully to get people up to speed with at least the kind of problem I'm trying to address and some background material related to it. So now, having given that background, the thesis of this dissertation is as follows. I'm just going to read this straight. The trusting trust attack can be detected and effectively countered using the diverse double compiling DDC technique as demonstrated by three things. A formal proof that DDC can determine a source code and generate executable code with correspond. Two, a demonstration of DDC with four compilers. And three, a description of approaches for applying DDC in various real world scenarios. This dark blue highlighting here basically describes the rest of my presentation, and really the rest of the dissertation as well. I'm going to be describing the trusting trust attack just a little bit more, although we've already seen a lot of that. Uh, a little bit more about the DDC technique, and then a formal proof, demonstrations, and some discussions about real world scenarios. So with that, uh, we've really already talked about what the, what the trusting trust attack is, and indeed the trusting trust, the motivation but let me point out a little bit further about the trust and trust attack that I think is important to know. Uh, three terms, triggers, payloads, non-discovery. Basically, triggers and payloads, frankly, these are generic terms for any attack, okay? A trigger is simply a condition determined by the attacker with, you know, upon which the malicious event is to occur. And the payload is what happens when the trigger occurs, okay? Uh, and finally, non-discovery. It's really important in the trust and trust attack the victim doesn't know that his compiler's been subverted. If the, if the victim knows that their compiler is subverted, and particularly can detect how, then they can go back and use a different compiler or do different approaches. And basically, the whole game in tr the trust and trust attack depends on this inability to be certain that you've discovered it or not discovered it. All right, chapter four of the dissertation provides an informal description of diverse double compiling. This was not actually my idea. I do want to give credit to someone else. Uh, Henry Spencer created the original idea in 1998. Now, his description was a few sentences long. <laughs> I've gone way beyond what his original idea was. Uh, and I've extended in various ways and so on. But I do want to give him credit for the, for the original idea. And his basic idea was, gee, maybe we could use a different compiler, what we'll call a trusted compiler. I put an asterisk there because we're going to have to define that word trusted very carefully in a moment. But just hold on to that thought for a moment. We're going to need to define that term. Then we're going to use two compilation steps. We're going to compile the source of what's called the parent compiler. And then after that, we'll use the results to compile the source of some compiler under test. This is the compiler. The compiler under the test is the one we actually care about. If the DDC result is bit for bit identical to the compiler under the test C sub A, then the source and executable correspond. We don't have the trusting trust attack. The source and executable correspond. Now, it's important to know that the DDC approach cannot show that the program is perfect or non-malicious or anything like that. What we can show is the source and, and executable correspond. Um, but that, that is a very, very useful thing to know because once I know the source and executable correspond, I now can go examine the source code, which people are used to doing. This is, this is, in fact, what source code is all about, is, is making it easier for humans to develop software and makes our problem much, much easier. We fundamentally change the nature of the problem. Now, Henry had this idea a couple sentences, but he never examined it, never justified it in detail, never tried it, certainly never proved it. So I took this idea and ran with it. Um, and I've actually had some little email conversations over the years as I've gone along with this, too. Is well aware of this. So, I've given you verbally a very brief description of what DDC is about. Let me show some graphs that hopefully will kind of clarify this a little bit. And it may be easier to clarify this by first thinking about how was the compiler supposed to have been created in the first place? This doesn't mean it was created this way, but at least how was it supposed to have been created? Uh, this is what I call the plain origin. Somewhere there was almost certainly a grandparent compiler talk about there are some exceptions, but usually there's a grandparent. And it is used to compile the source, what I call S sub P, the source of the parent compiler. And I produced some compiler, and then I used that parent compiler to compile the compiler that I actually cared about, which has another source, which I'm calling S sub A. And then that produces another compiler, and that's what I call C sub A, the compiler under test C sub A, which is supposed to correspond to the source code S sub A. Now, with that, 
What is the reverse double compiling? Well, it looks a whole lot like that claimed origin. The big change here, at least one of the probably most fundamental change, although there are other possible changes here too, is that that grandparent has been changed to a trusted compiler. And I still feed in source of the parent and source of A, and then I still produce an executable. Um, and then once I produced through this DDC process, I then can do a comparison. Is this equal to that? If they are, and certain other conditions hold, then the source and compiler correspond, otherwise they don't. Now, I'm being a little, uh, superficial is the wrong term, but I'm, I'm omitting some important issues. For example, there are many different possible environments. There's no requirement that this environment and this environment be the same, or the same for these two. And environments can have inputs into compilations as well. Uh, random numbers, thread scheduling, that sort of thing. Nevertheless, um, uh, and I have to account for those things when I get into the formal proof and prove this thing correct, but uh, I don't want this additional detail to confuse you. The basic idea is that this trusted compiler is replacing the grandparent compiler and you do some other things and then, well, these are supposed to be equal. Now, let me give some informal description of the assumption of this. First of all, I'm assuming that DDC is being performed by trusted programs and trusted processes. And that includes not just the trusted compiler, which I'm calling C sub P, uh, but I also need trusted environments, a trusted comparer, to make sure that things are victim and equal. And I need to be able to make sure that when I get C sub A, S sub P, and S sub A, that I get those in a trusted manner. Now, I hinted that the word trusted was really important. So now I need to define that term. By trusted, I mean there's a justified confidence that whatever it is that's trusted does not have triggers and payloads that would affect the results of DDC. What's interesting here is I don't require them to be non-malicious. It's perfectly okay that if they're malicious, as long as they don't affect the DDC results, because I'm only using them in the DDC process to make certain claims. Uh, that's actually important because it's a whole lot easier to say, well, if they're malicious, it's probably not malicious the same way. And I'll talk more about that in a moment, but uh, in a later chapter here. Uh, I am also assuming correct languages. Hopefully those of you who are familiar with compilation, I mean, this is, I guess, almost obvious, but I should at least mention, if, if you've got uh, a program written in the Java language, you have to use a Java compiler, and so on. Um, I also require that the compiler defined by S sub P is deterministic. The same inputs always produce the same outputs. Uh, and real compilers generally do meet that criteria. I mentioned earlier the bootstrap test. The bootstrap test also requires determinism. And a lot of people like to use the bootstrap test. And therefore, it's all, and even if they don't want to use the bootstrap test, if a compiler is not deterministic, a compiler can be written to be non-deterministic, it's much harder to test because that means that every time you run the compiler, it'll produce the same result, different result, with the same inputs. That is much harder to test, um, and therefore, real compilers do tend to meet this criteria. Now, I get the same comments over and over again every time I give this presentation or people skim my paper, uh, even though I've tried to make it very clear there are headings specifically pointing this out. So let me be very, very clear. DDC does not presume that different compilers produce identical executable. In fact, in general, though, that isn't true. Generally, different compilers typically produce different executables. That's okay. However, let's go further. Let's, give, let's look at this C program. It's a very, very trivial C program. It just computes 2 plus 2 and prints it. Okay? About as simple as you can get. And now imagine that I have two different compilers that process this input, and both compilers are properly working C compilers in a proper environment, and so on. The resulting executables of those two different uh, compilers will almost certainly be different. And I use two different compilers, I send it the same input, but there's no requirement that the output be the same. However, when I run those two different executables from those two different compilers, I better see four produced from both of those executables. Because two plus two really is four, and, that, and the C standard basically requires that I be able to do this kind of calculation correctly. Therefore, you know, presuming certain assumptions like the environment is working correctly and so on, even though the, a compiler may produce a different executable than another one, when I run them, there are certain things that have to be the same. And my situation with compilers is more complicated than that, but hopefully that gives you an idea of, of the approach I'm taking. Now, there's a special case. What happens if the parent compiler is the same as the compiler under test? Um, 
when that happens, I have a term for that. I call that a self-parenting compiler, when the parent is the same as the compiler but not actually testing. Uh, I actually published about this approach in 2005 in AXAC. Um, in that particular case, I presume this, this particular case, and only this case, the dissertation is actually more general. I'm no longer requiring this. And so the dissertation includes what the 2005 paper described as a special case. Now, uh, just give me just a second here. Why not always use the trusted compiler? If I've got this trusted compiler and I know it's wonderful and so on, then why not just use it all the time? Well, there's actually a lot of reasons why you might want to use, do that. One is it just may not be suitable for general use at all. Uh, and I've given a long list here. Maybe slow, pretty slow code, produces code for a different CPU than the one you wanted, costly, maybe it has some undesirable license restrictions, maybe it's very limited, lacks some few functions you'd like in your real compiler. Um, in particular, a simple, easily verified compiler could be used as the trusted compiler, which actually brings an interesting link into this second book. Using a different compiler greatly increases the confidence that the source and executable correspond. The source and, and executable correspond if the compiler is trusted and certain other things can, uh, are true. So by using a different compiler, I can greatly increase, depending on what I choose, uh, my confidence that I've met my assumptions. In particular, an attacker is generally not going to know ahead of time what compiler I'm going to use as my trusted compiler and my trusted environment and so on. This makes it a real challenge for the attacker. Usually the uh, attacker gets to choose a large number of different places to attack and aim them to succeed and it's very, very difficult for a defender because the defender often has to defend a large number of places. Here we've got the roles reversed and that's really great from the defender's point of view. Here the attacker does not know which compiler is going to, probably does not know which compiler is going to be used as the trusted compiler, which means the attacker may have to attack a whole bunch of different trusted uh, compilers to make sure that they get the one that I was going to use as my trusted compiler. And what's more, a defender can even perform DDC multiple times. Now that the attacker has to subvert multiple compilers, all the compilers that were used as trusted compilers, this makes it very, this greatly increases the difficulty of an undetected attack. Uh, I was asked earlier a good question, and that was, well, this looks a lot like end version programming. Is this the same as end version programming? The answer is no, but it's a good question, so let me clarify that. Uh, inversion programming is fundamentally different from DBC. Um, in DBC, I'm oh, sorry, in inversion programming, the idea is that you start with a common specification, and then you have multiple programs implement that same common specification. Now, once you have those programs, you send them a bunch of input, input one, then input two, input three, input four, and so on. And then you can look at the outputs, input one, two, three, four, and the same for the other programs. I'm showing you n equals three, but it could be an arbitrary number. And then you can compare the outputs. Output one should all be the same because they all got the same inputs and they're all trying to follow the same specification. Uh, un unfortunately, what was found in a very interesting paper by Knight and Levison is that <clears throat> the uh, independence of errors doesn't, doesn't hold. What's that mean? It turns out that if you take some program and you give it an input and it produces the wrong output, you might think that program two is has a, would have a random chance of having an error with the same input. And unfortunately, that's not true. If one program gives incorrect output given a certain input, uh, it is much more likely than random chance that program two will also fail to produce the right output given the right input, uh, given the same input. Um, now, that's interesting, um, but it doesn't really apply to DDC. First of all, we are in DDC, we are trying to detect when we do not have a common specification. Fundamentally, I may have one program that the compiler that hopefully is implementing this, the uh, language specification correctly, but I'm worried if another compiler is trying to meet a different specification that involves the trust and trust attack. That's different. That is not at all the same. So you, it, this is not the kind of attack that would happen by accident. This is not, oh, I swapped a plus with a minus, okay? It's not that it's impossible to implement the trust and trust attack, but it requires serious thought. Um, and uh, I specifically selected my trusted compiler so it was unlikely to have the trust and trust attack. Um, and second of all, DDC fundamentally involves a single input. It's that pair of S sub a, P and S sub A, the parent compiler and the compiler under 
A compiler, in general, should be able to take lots of different programs in a given language and produce it. But I don't care about those. I'm only caring about one pair, not a large set of possible inputs. In the knight Levson test, they use, I believe, a million inputs, trying to simulate about 20 years of active life of the program that they were using. I'm not worried about a million possible inputs. I'm only worrying about one pair. All right. Now, let me, let me uh, wind up for section five. Uh, I have made some claims that if DDC, uh, if you apply DDC and you meet certain assumptions, then, and there's a bit for bit equality, then the source and exclude will correspond. Now, in my 2005 AXEC paper, I have an informal English justification for that. You're more than welcome to read that if you'd like. However, can we do better? There's always the risk when you present an English level description that, well, maybe I. I certainly wasn't intentional on my part, but maybe I skipped an important step or didn't find my terms as clearly as I needed to and so on. And so there's always the possibility of somebody reading my, my 2005 paper saying, well, you know, that's an interesting justification, but I'm not sure I believe it. So what can we do? Is there something I can do that would give a stronger justification? Well, I'm not the first person to have the concern that, gee, I want a really strong argument that something is true. The picture of uh, Gottfried Leibniz, who wrote in 1685 about why we solve this very problem. Okay? And he believed the only way to rectify our reasonings is to make them as tangible as mathematicians. So when there are disputes, we can simply say, let us calculate, calculemus, and we can see who's right. Wouldn't it be great if we could just plug in and do some math and prove that the statements I just made earlier are actually true? Well, unfortunately, we can't do that with all human problems. But the good news is that for the kind of problem that I've got, uh, that I'm describing here with DDC, there are notations in deductive systems that are sufficient for proving it for our purposes. So chapter five of the dissertation presents a formal proof. A formal proof is basically the gold standard for proving that an argument is true. Now, I don't know of any stronger way of proving a claim than a, a formal proof. Uh, now, I will certainly grant that it's a little from my opinion in some places. Uh, I've done the best I could to make it clear. Uh, but you know, there's some heavy math in there. But before you get too concerned about the mathematics, remember the point here is to prove beyond a shadow of doubt. If you accept the assumptions, the conclusions necessarily follow. So it's much more rigor than the informal justification of the 2005 paper. So it is based on it. It's essentially taking the 2005 paper and you know, using the extension so I'm no longer uh, assuming that I've got self-parenting compilers and basically formalizing it. I've used classical first-order logic with equality. This is a very, very, very widely accepted uh, logic notation, mathematical notation. Uh, I am not creating a new mathematical or logic system. Okay? I'm using mathematics to model a circumstance. If you imagine a bridge builder trying to design a bridge, First, imagine what your bridge is going to be, and then you translate that into mathematics, and then try to determine things like, is the bridge going to hold up the loads that's supposed to hold up? Same sort of circumstance in my case. I am trying to take the idea of DDC, translate it into mathematical notation, and then make proofs that it has uh, certain properties. In my case, is not how much will the bridge hold up, but that DDC will counter the that. I used several tools. The two tools in particular that I used were Perver9 and IV. I'll talk about what those are and why they should help convince you that the proofs are right. And I'll talk very briefly about the three proofs and the correct goals and assumptions. I don't plan to go through in detail each of the assumptions, but I can if you want me to. And we'll, I'll go through my, my basic presentation, and then if we have time and somebody wants me to, we can. But if it helps, over here, are actually graphical diagrams of every one of the proofs. Okay, on the left is the DDC diagram, and then proof number one, number two, number three. And over here is another copy of proof number one. Okay? So anybody who wants to, you can actually see the proof as a graphical notation, and the dissertation itself has the proofs in traditional uh, three column, really, uh, format. With that, let me talk to you a little bit about the tools that I use. Uh, Prover 9 and 90. Prover 9 is a tool that takes statements in first order logic and attempts to generate a proof. Obviously, if it can't be proved, it won't be able to generate a proof. Um, uh, but uh, if it can prove the goal, it will output the proof that the assumptions that I gave it produce the goal that I gave it. 
uh, and if you're familiar with uh, more technicalities, it's a proof by contradiction. Uh, DDC was then modeled using first order logic, and in particular using Pruvernine's representation of first order logic. Uh, and uh, then I actually managed to prove the three things I need to prove. I use a separate tool that can verify Pruvernine proofs. One obvious question is I use a computer program in order to generate proofs. Well, what happens if a program has a bug? Well, that's a valid concern. So um, my approach to counter that is I used a completely separate tool called Ivy. Now, Ivy can't create proofs. But what it can do is check each step and say, well, OK, this step to this step, that's OK. This step to this step, that's OK. And so it can verify that a proof generated by Prover 9 is correct. Uh, Ivy itself has been proved using ACL2. Apple, Apple it's actually been a formally proved, it's a formally proved program that can prove uh, the accurate, uh, correct, I should say. I prefer nine, IB and Apple II are all open source software, so they're available to review by the world. Um, and I should also note that the proofs also have been hand verified. I've actually walked through, walked through every step. Some coworkers of mine have walked through every step. Um, you know, and uh, basically, all of that provides really, I think, excellent evidence that these proofs that, I've, that are graphically shown on the walls here are accurate. Given the assumptions, the conclusions must necessarily follow. I've got an original, an original program, so I don't have to worry about manual error. If the program is error, I've got program after program backing me up. And in addition, we've got hand checks. Uh, I really believe the conclusions must follow. Yes, sir? Did you verify the source to binary mapping for this tool? I did not do that. Um, but you know what? I, but I did use diversity. Because Ivy and uh, Ivy and Apple II are completely separate programs. So while it's not diversity in the DDC sense, I do have a diversity of different tools checking. And besides all that, as I said, I've actually walked walk through these myself. Unlike an executable, the, the reason the trust and trust attack is so nasty is because it's very, very difficult. It's completely impractical, I'll argue, for real compilers to be hand analyzed, you know, line by line in their machine code. Okay? Can you do it conceptually? Yes. But it's very difficult. This is different. Okay? Um, people can eyeball these directly, and I have, and other people have. So the trusting trust attack doesn't really apply anyway, because as soon as you analyze it line by line, and you can practically do that, well, then you've analyzed it directly. Uh, let's see, whoops, I thought backwards here, sorry. All right, so what are my three proofs? Question. Yo, yes, please, sir. Sorry, um, no problem. The actual two Ivy, is that a proof of the Ivy specification or is it a proof of the Ivy implementation? Ah, I know that's not your dissertation, but I mean. Yeah, it's, it's not my dissertation. Um, it's actually an interesting, I, I'm, I, I'm gonna have to give you a, a, the actual answer is convoluted, so how do I make that simple? Um, the, the, the short answer is that um, uh, IV is written in um, the ACL2 language, which is essentially a variant of common list. Okay? And ACL2 can prove properties of its variant of list, which looks a whole lot like common list. Okay? Now, what it's going to prove, it's going to prove things at the S expression level, actually. Okay? Um, is that source, is that binary? I, I'm going to argue that it's probably really the source code level. Um, but that's that's where it is. Okay. As I said, you know, there's a valid question about well, how do you believe them? Well, if nothing else, you know, I've hand checked them myself. So, and other people have too. And in fact, you're more than welcome to go look in each of these steps. I can explain what they all involve. But that's actually why I'm posting these, so you can actually, if you want to, verify for yourself. So, let's get back to the three proofs here. Um, oh goodness. Clocks an hour wrong. All right, proof number one. There are three proofs in chapter five. Okay? The first proof is essentially the heart of this entire dissertation. Okay? Uh, and I'm going to, I'll just read this text down. Proof number one says that if DDC produces the same executable as the compiler of a test, which is C sub A, then the source code S sub A corresponds to the executable C sub A. This requires five assumptions and took 19 steps for uh, proof nine to prove this. Uh, in first order logic, this is what it looks like. Stage two is the result of DDC. 
And what this says is that if stage two equals CA, that implies that CA and SA exactly correspond. Now, of course, uh, no, we got another one over here, so <laughs> we even have a diversity in posters. Um, all right. Uh, now, these additional parameters deal with environments and languages and so on. But fundamentally, that's what this says. Now, originally I thought that was going to be the only thing I needed to prove. But as I got into this, I realized that no, I had another proof uh, that I needed to make. You see, um, it's perfectly possible in mathematics to prove something of the form of if A then B, but A could never occur. It's perfectly possible to prove things like if 1 equals 0, then 5 equals 6. But that's not enough. I want to be able to prove that this technique actually works in the real world. And so as long as I just left it here, that didn't show that it could actually happen in the real world. So I need to be able to prove that there are conditions where this could actually hold. Turns out that's actually more complicated to do. It took, it required nine assumptions and 30 steps to prove that claim. Um, and what the proof number two says is that under benign conditions, and a particular condition called CP corresponds to SP, the DDC results stage two, and the, compi the original compiler of the C sub A will be the same. Now, this CP corresponds to SP. Well, how do I know that that's true? Well, I've got a third proof here that proves this particular condition, CP corresponds to SP, is true. And that requires that there's a benign environment with a grandparent compiler. And uh, quickly, I can prove this, which is, which is actually just CP corresponds to SP. Uh, the reason I split these two up, by the way, is because proof number two does not require that there be a grandparent. Usually, there's a grandparent compiler. But in the very, very early stages of compiler development, there may not be, at least you may not be, or you may not be able to determine if, uh, for certain, there's a grandparent compiler. So by splitting this up, this is more general, and this assumes that there's a grandparent compiler. There, if there's no grandparent compiler, you'll have to find that this is true some other way. All right. Next, basically, I've used a number of different tools, as well as hand checking and so on, to determine whether or not, given the assumptions, the conclusions necessarily follow. I believe that's <laughs> proved that uh, beyond, uh, beyond any reasonable doubt. However, there is always that problem. Remember I mentioned earlier the bridge building analogy? Somebody who's designing a bridge and tries to model it in mathematics. There's always the risk, whenever you model anything in mathematics, that your model does not correspond to reality. You know, I had an idea of a bridge, I translate it to mathematics, but I assume that wood can take a billion pounds of force. Okay, and wood doesn't. So, you know, I can make assumptions in my mathematical model that are not realistic, in the, uh, are not a realistic representation of the real world. So how can I have some confidence that my mathematical representation, my assumptions and goals, are, a real, are a, an accurate representation of the real world? Obviously, I can't show that formally. I can prove that certain things are true, but I can't prove that the math is an accurate representation of the real world. That's part of the problem, right? However, there's a lot of reasons to believe that these are an accurate representation of the real world. First of all, I have proven that the assumptions are consistent. Um, in a lot of logic systems, and that includes classical first order logic, if you assume that two things are blatantly contradictory, you can actually prove anything. If you can prove, if you assume that A is equal to B and A is not equal to B, and you accept both of those assumptions boldly, you can prove all sorts of things. That's not good. So how can I deal with that? Well, uh, it turns out that I can create something called a model, and I, I could get into that. Uh, well, <coughs> we'll have to tape those back up later. Um, I'm sorry? That's a replicated paper. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> uh, we can put them back up. Though, so. uh, in any case, um, I can create a model for each of these formulas given the assumptions, and that means that they, they cannot be an A equal, not, a equal B and an A equal not B. That doesn't prove, of course, that the assumptions are an accurate model of the real world, but at least they're consistent. That's the first step, okay? Um, I, can, I should also note that the proof assumptions are based on my informal justification in the paper I published in 2005. No one has refuted the, uh, the informal justification I published in 2005. It was peer-reviewed before it was published, and of course, people have had a lot of chance to look at it since 2005. No one has refuted that informal article justification. So that's another good reason to believe, you know, since it's based on that, that these are, are, are correct. Uh, I've had lots of people review these. No one has said, oh, this assumption is just plain wrong or anything like that. 
Um, all the demonstration results are explainable by the proofs. Later on, I will describe, I've actually done, uh, actually applied PVC in several cases. Had some interesting results, some of which were perhaps not what I was hoping for or expecting, but all of them were explainable in terms of these proofs and the assumptions. And that's a, that's a useful um, a reason to believe that these are valid or are, are correct. Um, the formalization process itself forced me to clarify some things. And I'll argue that, hey, that means I've, I've, I had to learn something. I suddenly, I thought I had one proof, I ended up with three. It means I must have learned something. You want somebody who has hopefully gained some insight creating your proofs. And I think it's very clear that the proofs fit together. But you look at them backwards, Number three says if it's benign and grandparent, then CP corresponds to SP. Number two says if it's benign and CP corresponds to SP, then stage two equals CA. And number one says if stage two equals CA, then CA and SA correspond. So it's, it's very, very clear how those three fit together. All right, that was chapter five, which is probably the most forbidden chapter in the dissertation. Uh, number chapter six discusses methods to decrease diversity. The name of this technique that I'm describing is diverse double compiling. Where does this diverse come from? Well, we need some justified confidence in the trusted compiler and the uh, environments. Okay, that's what that word trusted is all about. So how can I get that trust? Well, maybe I have to have a complete formal proof of the executables of the compilers and their environments. That would certainly be um, uh, compelling evidence, but that's very, very difficult to do. Maybe there are other ways we can do this. Uh, and I believe that another much, much simpler way of doing this is diversity in general. Diversity in compiler implementation. Use a different compiler. Uh, diversity in time. Use a trusted compiler that was developed long, long before. It's possible that a compiler developed 20 years ago could, insert, could include a tax for a compiler that was just written this year. But it's not that likely. Uh, yes, you could try to rig the later compiler so it had vulnerabilities that the older compiler this is, it becomes very, very difficult to do. Um, diversity environment. Some payloads are dependent on specific environments. If you change the environment, the payloads fail. And diversity in the source code input. Um, this involves uh, changing the source code. And there's two kinds, semantics preserving and uh, non-semantics preserving. I can go into this in more detail, but I think I'm running a little short on time, so I'm gonna skip that. Well, if people want to ask me questions, that's fine. Chapter seven uh, provides demonstrations of diverse double compiling. It's easy to say, hey, I've got a mathematical proof that if I can make this happen, then these other wonderful things could happen. But that doesn't show that you could do it in the real world. Just because you can show that certain conditions could happen in mathematics, that doesn't mean it's practical on the real world, you know, given limited resources and uh, time and money and so on. Well, I've done DDC uh, four times. Um, I've applied DBC four times, four different compilers. And I think uh, that those four different compilers are demonstrating that this is something that you can do. Uh, I'll talk first about TCC or TinyCC, which was actually the subject of my 2005 paper. So I'll talk about two Garrick Lisp compilers and GCC. So first let me talk about TCC. TCC is a tiny C compiler. Uh, it has a small separate, separate runtime library, so it ended up being, that, what that meant is that I had to do things in pieces, uh, but it worked just fine, uh, eventually. However, I did have some troubles when I tried to apply TCC, and they turned out to be uh, difficulties in the TCC implementation itself. First of all, it turned out that the TCC compiler had a defect. It was a relatively small one, uh, and it's, the problem was that it failed to side extend 8-bit casts. What's that all about? Well, let me back up a little bit. Uh, TCC is a compiler for several different uh, CPUs, but the CPU I used was the standard Intel x86 32-bit. Uh, lots and lots of people have these uh, kinds of processors, very, very common processors. Like many CPUs, it can represent constants in a, in a certain range, minus 28 to 127 with a smaller representation. It can represent constants like that in one byte instead of four. It can use four to represent constants of that of those values, but it can represent those also in one byte, and there are certain reasons you might want to do that. But TCC tries to detect that a constant that it's given is within this range, 
by using a cast, in particular it's using something called an 8-bit uh, side extension cast. Okay, and then it uses that cast to decide, oh, wait a minute, I've got a, a number within that little range, I'll use the short form. The problem is that the cast produced the wrong answer. And what that meant was that PCC was, now it could have meant, and it would mean in certain programs that produced something that was just absolutely completely wrong. In the case of TCC though, what it would do is it would generate the long form of the machine code instead of the short form of the machine code. Now, it you know, for when you're compiling, when TCC is compiling itself, it turns out that from an execution point of view, this makes no difference at all. Okay, all it's doing is it's storing numbers in a slightly longer form that's necessary, but if you uh, disassemble it and look at the assembly language, they look exactly identical. It's only when you look at the machine code that you realize, oh, wait a minute, it's different sizes than it was supposed to be. Uh, so, uh, although DDC is intended to be a compiler test, it turns out to be a pretty sensitive one. Uh, the second issue that I had were TCC junk bytes. Uh, TCC supports a type called the long double, which is an 80-bit value. Uh, those of you familiar with the Intel x86 will recognize that as one of the built-in forms that the C CPU supports for floating point calculations. Nothing wrong with that. That's actually a widely supported type. The problem is that 80 bits comes out to 10 bytes. And 10 bytes is actually an annoying size to allocate. The system could allocate things of that size. But TCC, like actually many other programs, prefers to allocate in units of 4 bytes. Not a problem. What it does is it allocates 12 bytes instead of 10 and sticks in 10 bytes in there. Not a problem. You can certainly stick a 10-byte value into a 12-byte box. The problem is what happens with the other two bytes? And the answer is TCC doesn't set them at all. It just lets them do whatever it is. And the problem, of course, is that I'm assuming that the compiler is uh, portably, um, um, oh, I lost my train of thought here, uh, deterministic. Okay? So it's not deterministic. Those bytes will be different values depending on lots of other factors. And so the, those chunk bytes turn out to be, to be a problem for me. So I fixed TCC, and once I fixed those two things, DDC worked exactly as predicted. And in fact, each of these things you can trace back to the proof assumptions and point out, oh, it's, it, DDC didn't work because this assumption wasn't met, this assumption wasn't met. And uh, once I had one that worked correct, I could use the verify TCC to verify the original one. So it works. Uh, I'm not, I could go into detail in this picture. I'm uh, going to be, uh, I can come back to this if people want, but I'm running a little short on time, so I'm going to just simply note that uh, this is a graph that shows TCC. And the key, only key thing I really want to point out was that TCC actually has two parts, what you, what you would consider the inner part of the compiler and a library that's based on. And in fact, uh, DDC can handle that just fine. So, moving along from TCC, now I'm going to talk about two lists of compilers. Now, first of all, I should point out that now I'm using a different language. So it doesn't work just with C. Uh, TDC works with any language. But it's nice to show that it works with two different languages. More importantly, I had two, a pair of compilers. Garrett calls them the correct and the incorrect compilers. Uh, but the incorrect one, most importantly, is uh, the source code of a maliciously corrupted, it was one that's going to generate a maliciously corrupted executable. Okay? DC should be able to detect that I've got a problem. Well, let's put in a problem and see if it detects it. So we apply DDC. The correct compiler, correct, correct, like you would expect. Um, but then, basically, we compiled what was called the incorrect compiler, and then claimed that that was the executable that was matching the correct source code. They shouldn't correspond. They don't actually correspond. The question is, could DDC detect that they didn't correspond? And the short answer was, oh yes. Right away, DDC detected that these do not correspond. This maliciously corrupted executable does not correspond to this source. Now, what was interesting is that I actually did a diff to compare the uh, DDC result to the corrupted result. And what was very, very interesting was right away, you could tell from the very first lines that there was a serious problem going on. The first line of difference, I think it was the first or second line of difference, said basically, if you're compiling the logger program, do this incredibly different thing instead. Now, no compiler should have in the middle of it a, if I'm compiling the logger program, do something different. Okay, that is a dead giveaway that something is terribly, terribly wrong. So it's so not only did it detect, but the information gathered from DEC 
differences that it detected were a big tip-off. And of course, in my case, I already knew it was maliciously uh, corrupted, but it's nice to see it in action. Finally, GCC. GCC was the GNU Compiler Collection. Well, one time we named the uh, GNU C Compiler, but now it's called the GNU Compiler Collection. It's a very widely used compiler in industry. And I applied DDC to GCC to show that DDC could scale up to real compilers. TCC and the correct and incorrect compilers I just showed you are basically toy compilers. It's, they're, they're great for research, tests, to start out on, but they don't show that this thing scales. Here, if I can apply it to DDC to, DDC to GCC, then I know that this approach can scale up to real purpose because people really do use the GCC compiler. compiler. Now, GCC supports a wide variety of languages. Uh, in order to make this something I could do in my lifetime, <laughs> I, you know, I've tried to narrow this down. So uh, I narrowed it down specifically to the C compiler. For my trusted compiler, I use the Intel C++ compiler, ICC, which, uh, in spite of its name, is also a perfectly reasonable C compiler. It's a completely different compiler. Um, if I was going to do, use this to show GCC was, was completely um, uh, free of malicious or aggression. If I was going to use this to show GCC source next Google corresponded, I would need to talk more about how do I know that ICC is completely independent. But purely to show scale, I don't need to go into that. Uh, originally, I was trying to use Fedora uh, to um, regenerate the actual executable that they had in their system. It turned out I couldn't do that uh, for an interesting reason. Uh, Fedora, uh, like a lot of folks, uh, turns out, doesn't store quite enough information to re exactly reproduce its compilers. I found that a little surprising, but when I talked to them further, uh, it made some sense. So instead, what I did is I basically simulated the whole process so that I could capture. I basically simulated creating a GCC executable, and then I, I applied DDC to see if indeed they correspond. Uh, and I'm just including GCC, I'm not including uh, all the stuff, the environment around that. I'm just including GCC itself. Uh, oh, I should mention the second to last point. Uh, the program named GCC is actually a front end. Uh, the program that's actually the C compiler has a different name called CC1. So I had to make sure I compared not just the GCC executable, uh, but the program called CC1. Okay. Uh, a. Uh, very, very simplified form. What I did first of all is I created a GCC executable for which I had all the information I needed. Okay? Um, uh, it was GCC 3.0.4. Doesn't really matter for my purposes which version it is. So I had an executable for which I had all the information about how it was compiled and so on. And then I applied DDC and tried to regenerate to show that these two were equal. But now I'm using the trusted compiler ICC. In my particular case, I'm using self regeneration. Um, which is a perfectly valid thing to do with these things. Now it turns out that I had a lot of trouble, and I, these slides are short, but they belie how much time this took. Uh, GCC is a big compiler. It's not a five-line compiler at all. Okay, so finding problems and finding out what exactly the issue is was made larger because of scale. Nevertheless, I was able to I was able to succeed here. The first problem I thought I had was that embedded in the executable itself is something called a master result path name. When GCC is compiled, it uses an intermediate temporary directory to store all, all of its results. That's fine, no trouble with that. What's odd is that this particular path name is actually stored in the executable itself, even though later users of the executable, why would they care where it was stored? Well, they may not, but it's in there. And because that's one of the inputs to the comp compilation, I have to, um, I basically have to make that match. Okay, this is the kind of detailed information that I need to be able to reproduce uh, our correct compilation. There was actually an interesting uh, tool semantic change. When uh, in GCC source code, it has uh, a number of build commands. One of them says tail plus 16 at C, which is supposed to mean skip 16 bytes and then, then uh, start reading the values. Unfortunately, more recent versions of POSIX have changed the meaning of this. Now this means read file plus 16C, which doesn't exist. So I had to handle some, I had to set some environment variables that would, that would basically make tail work the old way. That's fine. Okay. 
Um, these are the annoying details, but you've got to get these things right. And finally, GCC did not fully rebuild one of its key built one of its libraries. It includes a library. A lot of compilers, even the tiny CC, even the TCC compiler has a little library that it uses. Um, and unfortunately, GCC has such a library, but it does not recompile them on every step. It compiled them in the first stage, but it failed to compile it on the next stage. Um, this took a lot of time to trace back and determine what the heck was going on, because what I'm seeing is the executables differ in very odd ways. Both of them look reasonable, but why is this happening? But I did trace it back. Once I corrected this, DDC produced a bit for bit identical, bit for bit equal results, as was expected. Chapter eight, practical challenges. First of all, I should note limitations. Every technique has limitations. That's okay. It's important that we know what they are. Uh, and here's some of the key, here's what I believe are the key ones. First of all, this depends on the confidence in, in uh, that the DC, DDC process elements don't intrude triggers and payloads. In other words, you've got to trust your compiler, you've got to have a trusted compiler, trusted environment, and so on, okay? Uh, I've harped on that earlier, but that's important. DDC only applies to a specific executable under test. I can say that this source corresponds to this executable. I've got another executable. Does it correspond? I don't know. I'm going to have to redo this test, okay, or, or you want to find out what's going on. This is not a problem really for software. You just need to use cryptographic hashes to identify what do you use to test, okay? Just, um, the source code may have malicious code. All DDC shows is that the source and executable correspond. But I've changed the nature of the problem substantially. Now, I only have to look at the source code because I know the source and executable will correspond. That's much easier to do. If the DDC result is different from the compiler under test, at least one of the second proof's assumptions are wrong. The second proof says that given certain assumptions, the DDC result and the original compiler under test will be equal. That means that if they aren't equal, at least one of those assumptions is not true. But that does not tell you which one is not true. And so sometimes it can be a little difficult to find out which, you basically have to gather more information to find out, okay, one of the assumptions is a true which one. Uh, I mentioned non-determinism already. There's also a difficulty in finding alternative trusted compilers. Some languages it's very easy to find alternative trusted compilers. If it's a very usual language, you may have difficulty. You may have to write your own compiler uh, to have that trusted compiler. Um, there's also an interesting issue of countering what I call pop-up attacks. If you use DDC and you say, okay, this source and this executable correspond, well, that's useful information. But it's awful tempting for human nature just to keep moving and not apply DDC to later versions of the executable, okay? If you apply DDC to every executable and make sure it corresponds to its source code and so on, there's no trouble. But if you are, like, far too many human, well, if you decide, well, I did this test a long time ago, okay, and I'll just not do it for a long time, and then later on, you know, um, I'll assume that some later version is okay. Well, it turns out that there's all sorts of attacks you can do if you don't check every executable. The simple solution, by the way, is just use DDC for each one, and then the problem goes away. But if you if you check a long time ago, and then there's versions that happen since, if an attacker gets in since, they can, of course, do, uh, do harm. <clears throat> Uh, a compiler can actually have multiple components inside it. It's not a problem. TCC and GCC both had components inside them. Uh, DDC doesn't have any trouble with this. Uh, for lack of time, I'm going to be skipping uh, these, but I'm, uh, I, I could talk more about these if I wanted to. I, I should note um, uh, maliciously misleading code, though. Uh, one of these, DDC can show you that source code and executable correspond, which means I can now read the source code and see whether or not it's doing a malicious thing. Now, there is a possible, that one thing you can, can be concerned about, excuse me, is what if I read the source code, but what I think it does isn't what it really does. I term that maliciously misleading code. It's code where you can read it and you think it does something, but it actually does something quite different. And there's actually people who have demonstrated this but I talk about this briefly in my paper. There's actually countermeasures to counter that. Uh, a lot of these kind of things involve things like 
misleadingly formatted comments. So it looks like there's only comments, but in the middle you've written some, in fact, there's some code stuck in the middle of a comment. Well, really, that sort of stuff shouldn't be there, and it turns out there are countermeasures for maliciously misleading code. Things like for, first run, these, run the code through a format so that the format is misleading to people, force the format to be a standard format, those kind of formatting tricks basically go away. They are basically immediately revealed uh, to a human looking at it. All right, so how could an attacker counter DDC? Let's switch hats for a moment. I've been talking about it from the point of view of the defender, which is my interest here. But let's switch roles. And think about attacking this thing from the point of view of an attacker. Uh, I'm nearing the end, by the way, of my uh, slides here. Um, how can an attacker counter DDC? Okay. Somebody has a compiler. I want to create a maliciously corrupted executable out of some compiler. But my de the defender is now using DDC. What can I do? Well, basically, I'm going to have to falsify a DDC assumption. I've got mathematical proofs that say if these assumptions hold, this result must follow. So that means I'm going to have to falsify one of the assumptions of DDC. Um, unfortunately, that does, these aren't that easy to falsify. Well, unfortunate for the attacker. That's unfortunate, unfortunate for the defendant. Uh, one thing the attacker could do is he could try to swap the DDC result with C sub A during the DDC process. In other words, have the DDC of the person applying the reverse level compiler go through the entire DDC process, create an executable, and then just before he does the comparison, swap out the correct stage two with the compiler under test. If he can do that, well, then he's going to be con uh, comparing the cr maliciously corrupted executable with the maliciously corrupted executable and find out the same. The challenge, of course, is that the, presumably the defender is going to defend the environment used by the DDC. So could this happen? Yes, it could. But presumably the defender is going to be defending the environment used during DDC. So this isn't easy to do. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it certainly isn't easy. Um, I could also try to make sure that the compiler under test is not the compiler that's actually being run. Okay. Well, how, but the defender has techniques that they can apply as well. First of all, let's say the environment, there's two basic, two basic possibilities. The environment may provide an inaccurate compiler under test. Okay? So maybe I, when I say I want to extract the compiler under test to be used in this DDC environment over here, maybe the environment gives him what should have been running, but of course the environment doesn't run that program, it runs a different program. Well, <coughs> the, the uh, defender can extract it without using the environment. Maybe you turn off the system and you uh, examine the disk drive directly or whatever your storage medium is and extract the compile the executable directly. And that would help counter this, but then we have this issue. If the environment may run a different compiler, then the defend then what can the defender do? Well, th this is a this is a death, this is a bad one. However, what the defender can do is redefine the term compiler. Remember I mentioned earlier the compiler has to at least compile source to executable. But can do other things too. I can actually redefine a compiler to include not just what we would normally call a compiler, but the entire operating system. Now, what does that mean? Well, now it's got to meet all the DDC conditions. Now I have to have the source code of the operating system. All right, and I have to be able to recompile it. These are not impossible conditions to meet. And that mean, and if you do that, then this plays havoc from the attacker's point of view, because now I'm applying DDC. He's got to subvert something that I didn't include in my now large definition of a compiler. This gets harder and harder to do. Uh, finally, I can, uh, you know, I as the attacker, again, I'm switching roles here, I can try to subvert the trusted compiler and the trusted environment. But as I, as I hinted at earlier, the challenge for the attacker is that usually the attacker doesn't know what compiler will be used as the trusted compiler or trusted environment. And that means the attacker is going to have to subvert a whole bunch of trusted compilers a whole bunch of compilers, hoping that the defender will happen to choose that one. That's a difficult road to go. Uh, in fact, the defender can apply DDC multiple times, and that means that the um, excuse me that the defender has a serious advantage here. This is the advantage usually the attacker has. Usually, the atta as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, usually the attacker can attack a number of different places, and the defender has to defend them all. 
Now the attacker has to attack multiple compilers, and the defender only has to pick at least one of them that wasn't, that wasn't subverted. So for once, the defender gets the advantage. I won't say for once, but all too, uh, the defender gets the advantage that all too often the uh, attacker gets. So, my conclusions. In conclusion, DDC can show that source and executable correspond. Executables can, can have errors, could even be malicious, but these can be found by examining the source code, and that's much, much easier, as I've harked on several times. I think it's very, very important. It shows the correspondence, but knowing that there's a correspondence is very valuable. DDC is primarily useful to those who have access to the source code. Now, this actually gives us some advantage to open source because this means anybody can do this kind of check. Um, now, there's some interesting policy ramifications for compilers of critical software. Um, should you require, if you're writing critical software, the information to do DDC? I think that's, I think that's a plausible thing to consider. You know, require the use of unpatented language standards so that I can easily redevelop alternative compilers because I need another compiler to use as my trusted compiler. So the more likely it is that I'm going to have multiple trusted compilers that I can easily use, the easier it is for me to apply DDC. And there's all sorts of potential future work that could be done with this. I compiled GCC. There's no reason in theory you couldn't enlarge the definition of compiler to include an entire operating system, say, and go through that. I, don't, I didn't need to do that for this dissertation. But that certainly would be plausible future work. And with that, I believe the trust and trust detect can be detected and effectively countered by DDC. And that is my last slide. Okay, very good. So we're going to start the questions uh, from the committee first, and then we're going to open questions to the audience. Great. So, Jeff, would you like to start? Okay. I saw I sort of one of my previous questions on the slide. Okay. That, that, that was not by accident. <laughs> it was a good question. So. Well, thank you. Appreciate your affirmation. Uh, when did you start first at George Mason? I mean, as an undergraduate? Yeah. 87. 87. 87. I've been here a while. And when I first came here, Patriot Circle wasn't a circle, it was a C. <laughs> <Patriot Circle. laughs> they did have the names. So they didn't plan for it to be a circle, but it didn't go all the way around. Um, when did you start your master's? Oh, gracious. I'm going to have to look that up. I'm sorry, it's been long enough. But it's something like 94, something like that. I know I'm from a dissertation that has uh, when I finished my master's, which is, so obviously I must have when started. When did you finish your master's? finished in 1994. Okay, so it's the finished date, not the start date. So I probably started, oh, I don't remember, I must have, so I, I think I started right, so right away. Were you continuous? Uh, almost, yeah. So is this a record? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think the previous record I know is Ron Ritchie. He started his bachelor's after. Yeah, the, there's a break. Yeah, I, I, had, maybe I don't know who keeps those official. Right, I don't know. I, 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 I did have a break between my master's and my doctorate, I'm pretty sure, but it was like a year. Yeah, it wasn't long. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't long, but I have a family in full, working full time, and that has uh, kind of stretched things out. <laughs> It's not a complex engineering activity. Um, the um, it, frankly, the biggest, the hardest problem is the so first time. Can you reconcile that with the amount of time you actually? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. The, the short answer is yes. Um, I, I won't. I, I won't claim that it's easy, but it's not that difficult. The the, the conditions that I listed are. It's, it's basically comes down to: Can you make it deterministic? Can you get all the inputs? Um, really, I'm, I guess I'm going to answer your question backwards, but. Once you make the preconditions true, it's very easy to do. It's, um, you know, uh, it doesn't take that long in on modern hardware. When I first started, I used a relatively slow computer that I happened to have handy. 
after a while I decided that was a bad idea and I moved and I uh, got a much faster machine. But with modern hardware, it does not take that long, even with very large compilers, to compile them twice, one after the other. I've got a wonderful cartoon somewhere about you know, the length of time that it takes to compile, but um, it's not that long. The real trick is making the preconditions true, and the trick with that is, is tracking back to find out what the problem is. I will say that now that I've done it, I got better at it, and I think that um, and the problems that I listed in my paper for the particular uh, examples are actually good examples of the kinds of things to look for. Now, now that somebody's done it once, these are the kinds of problems to look for, and it'll be a lot easier for the next person because now they have an example of the kinds of things to watch out for, to look for. So I, I, I won't claim it's easy, but I, I will claim it's not that difficult. And once you do it, a compiler writer, a developer, I'm sorry, a compiler supplier can fairly easily keep these assumptions true. Because the kinds of assumptions you want true anyway, does the compiler correctly compile itself? Can it work deterministically? And really, a compiler supplier is going to want those to be true. And if it's not true, they're going to want to fix that, and then it'll be true from there on. Um, let, me ask the, okay. Okay. Go ahead. let me ask the same question just slightly differently. Sure. This, this problem was posed back in the days when you know, the number of languages you wanted to compile was probably countable on one hand, um, or two hands. It was back in the mid-'80s, so people were worried about Software development is wildly more complex now. People build software with hundreds of different environments and tools. Um, does, this, does, does this technique actually, it, it, it's much more complex now in terms of the numbers of tools used to build software. Okay. Uh, does this technique sort of scale to that kind of environment? I think the short answer is yes, it does scale. Uh, I remember that environment since I was <laughs> there too. Um, it wasn't as kind of simple as I, it wasn't as simple then, if I remember correctly. I mean, it, there was not one language to rule them all then either. No, but it was uh, a small number. A relatively small number. Um, I think that, that does I think that although there's you know, there's a very very large number of languages available today, when you start asking, well, what are the ones I'm most worried about? What are the situations where I'm really worried about attacks? The number of languages used in those kinds of circumstances is much smaller. Whether you like it or not, C is commonly used to develop the most low, the lowest level kernel components of operating systems and kernels. You have a certain relatively small number of other languages used. Um, we can quibble a whole lot about the numbers, but I, I think that for many cases, even if we don't do it for every single language that's in existence, we can point to here are the ones that are most critical, and I'll worry about the compilers for the languages that are used there. And you know, maybe I will never get around to proving the compiler that was used to create the dancing bears, but so what? Okay, I'll worry about the one that controls the dam, that controls the nuclear power plant, that controls the nuclear weapon. And, you know, I believe that that set is a much smaller list. If for no other reason than the people who build those kinds of systems tend to be very conservative in the languages and tools that they use, particularly for the core components. But, but the flip side of that argument is people are moving those kinds of critical applications. <laughs> well, they, yeah, but that's that's okay. Um, in a lot of cases, though, they tend to use the web applications for more of the GUI and user and user interface, and there's often some sort of core which says, I don't care what the user interface says, I'm not going to blow up while I'm still sitting on the platform. So even if the core, the, the web app is too complicated to apply this way, I'm not sure that's true, but even for the moment if I accepted that was true, I still think there are core components for which I want to make sure those are right. I, I want to make sure the compiler doesn't s subvert it. And I have a relatively small number of languages that I need to check. Uh, actually, uh, let me just pick back on the question that uh, Dr. Raman just asked. Uh, what you really um, you, after your experience with applying BBC to four compilers, do you believe that you'll be able to write uh, let's say, quote unquote, complete guidelines for compiler uh, vendors to build comp compilers that are oh. DDC friendly. Oh, how'd you know? Yes, I have thought about that. I have not written them, but oh yes, I have. While you're doing this, you can't, you can't help but think about, at least from the other direction, the 
why did they do this to me? It would have been so much simpler, you know, in the case of GCC. Why the heck do you include, in the middle of the executable, this path name? The only thing it's doing for me is causing me pain. Okay, maybe there's a reason for it, but I've talked to several folks, and well, actually, there's, I mean, it was just, nobody's given me a good reason for doing it that way. If they wanted to store that information, they could have stored it without putting any executable inside. So, um, I have not written it, but it certainly has crossed my mind on a number of occasions, at least from the point of view of, oh my gosh, I wish they hadn't done this. So I think if nothing else, I can list the, this caused me trouble, this caused me trouble, in a broader, more positive way. Um, and it really, as I said, the, the prime conditions, excuse me, for a compiler are the kinds of conditions that compiler supplier will want anyway. A compiler supplier is going to want their compilers to be deterministic. They're, too, they're really hard to test on. They're going to want the compiler to compile itself correctly. Okay, um, so uh, the TCC, for example, pointed out a problem that the later on developers actually fixed. The, but uh, that's the sort of thing that they would want to fix, of course. So it may be a pain the first time because, oh, I found this very subtle error in your compiler. And then that takes time to track down what the problem is. But once fixed, they're going to want to keep that fixed. Rely on can we rely on DDC capturing um, unexpected bugs? To rely on no. Okay, DDC is not intended to be a proof that the executable is correct. If you want that, there are a lot of books on proving your programs correct. I encourage you to go look at them. <laughs> you of course you're very very well aware of the challenges that you're talking about. It like and it is from that point of view, it's really like any test. Okay, if I take a if I take a simple program, remember I said very trivial simple C program that added two plus two and hopefully pr prints four. If I send that into a compiler and it produce, prints five, I may not know why it's wrong, but I know it's wrong. Okay, but if I send that into a compiler and it prints four, all I know is it worked that time. It doesn't show that the compiler works in all possible scenarios, and the same is true for DDC. DDC actually is rather sensitive. It manages to detect a large number of kinds of errors. Basically, what's going to detect is if the uh, trusted compiler, it's actually what it shows, the text is actually very complicated to say. But it's basically the process of DDC uses a different trusted compiler. And if the trusted compiler has a different semantic than the grandparent compiler, and it goes through, then you're going to detect a difference in semantics. Okay, so. Whether or not that matters depends, it would only be able to detect the difference in semantics in the process of compiling the parent and the compiler of the test. So it can be used as a, detect, as a technique for detecting certain errors. It certainly did for me. The, the, uh, you know, the error in casting is certainly not something I was looking for, <laughs> okay? But it did detect that, um, and then I had to deal with that. So it is able to detect certain kinds of errors. It's a somewhat sensitive test for errors but it cannot detect all errors. For that, I'm afraid you'll have to use other techniques. Okay. Uh, could you please uh, see if uh, we can get Dr. Sandu to see if he has any oh, kind of comments? Oh, Dr. Sandu, uh, can you? Uh, he, he's on mute. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'm OK. I don't have any questions. OK. Uh, because Rafik has a question. Yes, sir. I just, I think a, big, a major part of the short answer to John's question was, you said you don't run a lot of tests, essentially. To, but you're looking for something specific that you expect to show up. With, That's right. If it's there in the corrupted compiler. And that made me think, what if I write my corrupted compiler so that I inject something into the executable, but only under certain rare conditions, like only if you use a specific language feature? Right. Is okay. that something that maybe is a little bit harder for DDC to find? Um, no, actually, let, let me even go further. I have thought about this. I don't, I don't know if it's in the paper, maybe in the dissertation. Uh, maybe it's not. Uh, let me go further, actually. It, not only is it a rare con let me go two directions. First of all, the rare mm. and then the random, mm. okay, which I think is probably where you're going. Let's say it's a rare. It's, let's say the compiler works absolutely correctly, except under 
one rare condition. When I, as I define the trusting trust attack, what I'm worried about is perpetuation. So the case that must occur for the, the case that makes me worry, because if it's not, if it doesn't self-perpetuate, it'll just go away as I keep modifying the compiler. So it's got to at least involve the compiler. Otherwise, it doesn't self-perpetuate. But the compiler is the very input I'm using to test. So even if it's such a narrow condition that only a previous version of the compiler mm -hmm. would have been affected, that doesn't matter. That's the only input I'm using. So even if it's incredibly rare, it won't matter. But there is a variant of that that's interesting, and that's the random case. Let's say that it checks and detects the compiler, but only half the time does it infect itself. Okay, that, now that's, a, that, that's, uh, that's an interesting different case. Well, actually, there's two possibilities there. It infects itself or it doesn't. If it infects itself, then DDC will detect it. If it doesn't infect itself, then it basically is removing itself and then, first of all, DDC will correctly report that it's not there, because it's not. And from then on, future versions won't have it either. So even if the original one was randomly uh, malicious, DDC will still correctly report either, I got a good version, in which case I've got a good version, or it's not, and I can point it, point to it. So essentially, you have one test case. That's right. And that's the compiler. That's right. And but that's the only one, one really test case that matters. By definition, it's the only one that matters. So. It's Which very is why it's different. not really good testing to leader because it's not sampling from the input space. Um, if you if you're looking at it from a broad a testing, oh, I completely agree. This is not intended for general purpose testing of a compiler. Mm -hmm. I'm worried about the trusting trust attack, okay. and so this counters that. If you want general purpose test suite for compilers, I'm afraid you have to go somewhere else. It's not a bad test, and it did text, detect some problems, but that wasn't its purpose. It's just interesting to note that sometimes it works as that kind of situation as well. But that wasn't its purpose. So I'd like to open the floor for questions from the audience. Yes, Jeremy. You did a great, great uh, work. I, I think I'm going to come and hear you today. Um, two questions. The first one is, is um, if you're going down the road and you see a cop car, you can naturally slow down. Uh, can you repeat again? If you're going down, driving down the street and you see a cop car, you naturally slow down. So I'm wondering, what I'm wondering is if you're compiling the compiler and it is able to detect that you're in DDC mode, can it silently not do anything? And, and there are ways to detect, presumably, that you're using it for DDC purposes and thereby escape the detection. So that's my first question. Okay, let, let me answer one at a time okay. because my, my brain can only hold so many things at one time. So let me answer that one and then, uh, if this is a two-part, we'll go on to the next one. Um, basically, the question is, what happens if, can I detect I'm in DDC mode and do something different? Well, really, this goes back to, the, remember, I defined earlier what I required for DDC, okay? I'm requiring a whole bunch of trusted components, and it's not just the compiler. I am requiring the compiler and, excuse me, the environments that I use be trusted as well. So I am presuming that they don't have a, a counter DDC mode, okay? But, uh, for DDC purposes, it's not going to detect, at least for compiling this particular one, that the compiler that's I'm worrying about, it's not going to do something weird and different. Now, what about the compiler that's attacking? Well, it's, I'm, remember, I'm not trusting that at all. It, for, it could be dirty as sin, but all I'm caring about is I'm going to require the compiler to test and use some different, or possibly different environment that I trust that's then going to do the uh, recompilation and comparison. So if, if you're worried that the environment might subvert it, don't use that environment. Use a different one. In fact, I have uh, I've managed to acquire, for example, several really old SGIs and some other random machines under the presumption that you know, if I ever wanted to go further on this, it might be very, very interesting to have really different environments than the one that I'm testing. That is extremely unlikely to have attacks against the system that I'm testing because it is so different. You know, different CPU developed at different time, different organization. It is highly unlikely to have those kinds of attacks. I would recommend if you're applying DDC, don't have it connected to a network. Okay, I mean, yeah, for, for research purposes, I mean, it's fine, but, but if you were doing this for real and commercial environment, uh, or you know, some sort of environment where it's really critical that I get the DDC result right, you know, disconnect it from a network, use a really different machine, hard it up, you know, put walls around it, whatever, whatever makes you comfortable that indeed it's protected. Okay, so hopefully that answers your first part. Okay, the second one, which is not related to the first one, is 
whether this is applicable to hardware in the sense that, uh, I don't think you mentioned this, but um, uh, if you're compiling a, a, a FPGA layouts or things like that, um, and whether the compiler for the, the generates the, uh, the well, okay, I'll let you talk about that. <laughs> okay. okay, this one I anticipated. Uh, if those of you who have the uh, paper handouts, I've got a couple extra handouts if you'd like up here. Uh, uh, this is actually a question that uh, I, I, I that's easily anticipated, in part because the reflections on trusting trust paper, uh, as it was a speech originally by Ken Thompson, did mention uh, hardware as well. Um, there's actually a whole lot of answers to that. The short answer is yes, but I'm gonna have to extend it a little bit, okay? So, let me, uh, let me walk through. The question is, what about hardware? Can DDC apply to hardware? The short answer, yes, but here's the longer answer. First of all, if it's BIOS or microcode, fundamentally, it's still software, okay? It may be represented in a slightly different way, but it's fundamentally software, you handle it the same way. No, DDC applies trivially to those cases. DDC is completely unnecessary if what you're trying to counter is direct subversion of the hardware components, not trusting trust attack. You know, I grab an integrated component, an IC, and I just stamp onto it some malevolent subversion, okay? I, it's, you know, that's not a trusting trust attack in hardware. I'm just subverting a piece of hardware. Um, and so you don't really need DDC for that case. There are other ways to deal with that, but DDC isn't really what you need. Now. What is, what, when you say hardware and trust and trust attack, what does that mean? That means you've got hardware that has been subverted in such a way that intentionally subverts the implementation of other software or hardware. Now, once you have hardware subverted so that it subverts other hardware and software developed using it, now you have a trust and trust attack, and now it makes sense to apply DDC. And I think you can see already that that's actually not so easy, particularly for a lot of hardware you're typically talking a very, very different level of abstraction. It's not at all easy to develop uh, triggers and payloads, but let's accept that for a moment. Uh, it may be very difficult, but maybe somebody can come up with techniques, probably someone can, okay, to create triggers and payloads for future versions. What can we do? But I'm going, I want to go further, and let's talk about things where you're actually subverting the wiring, okay? I, I would include the FPGA specifically where it's, it's if different FPGAs work differently, too. So but let's, but, but let, let's talk about the case where the actual wiring is getting changed, okay? And it's getting changed in such a way that we're going to subvert future versions of the wiring, okay? And that's where this, uh, this slide uh, talks about here, okay? Here, can I deal with stuff that's truly hardware? It's not software or software-like, it's, it's hardware, it's the wire. I fiddled with the wiring, I added something so that I ended up with something subverted. And it's going to subvert future versions of hardware or software. Well, turns out you can apply DDC in this case. But there are some tricky complications, and I do talk about this in the dissertation. First of all, it requires a second implementation as a trusted compiler. Remember, I've got to I have, to have a trusted compiler, okay? Now, it depends on what what you're worried about as your tool. Uh, you may need an alternative hardware compiler for your um, uh, VHDL or whatever. You may need simulated chips and, and simulators. You also need a quality test. Now, the first one's not so bad, but this one is more difficult. And I will, I will there's no point in lying. This one is probably the challenge from hardware, is the quality test. Now, how the heck do I do a quality? On software, it's really easy. I check my bits. I'm not worried about the exact voltage level that's being used. In fact, that probably varies over time. Um, I'm only worried about one and zero. For hardware, um, I've talked to a number of folks. I, I actually have a double E degree, so I, I have some clue about how this stuff works. Um, but uh, I've also talked to some other folks who've looked specifically at this. 
And I have speculated that scanning electron microscopes, uh, stems, focused ion beams, optical phase array shifting, there are various techniques for getting information, very detailed information about a chip, its wiring and so on. And I believe that that would give you enough information to implement at a quality test. Uh, one of the interesting thing in particular is in many of these you can get information and then you can use super precision to uh, see the uh, diffraction differences. Now, the problem with that, particularly the diffraction technique, is that may give you information the wrong, you may get way more information than you wanted. Okay? It would be very easy to create false positives. You know, the real physical world is not ones and zeros. Okay? Every real chip is going to be slightly different if you look at it in enough detail from every other chip. And you've got to be careful to make sure that figure out which differences matter and which ones are just minor variations that are true for any manufacturing process. This also requires that you know the correct result. And this turns out not to be a technical problem, but a very serious legal impediment. It turns out that often the cell libraries that are provided to engineers are not what are actually used on the chips. And this is actually a real problem that kind of comes to uh, a lot of the, uh, the flight and a lot of the foundries from, the, uh, from where the engineers live. A lot of engineers who design chips are nowhere near a foundry. They design with the HDL and so on, ship it off to a foundry that may be thousands of miles away, and eventually they get a chip back. Okay? They have no idea what's on those chips. And what it turns out is that increasingly what's on those chips is not what they designed at all. And that's expected and normal. And why, have, you know, why don't they know that? Because they don't need to know that. All they know is their tool works and they get a chip back. And, uh, but what is actually put on their chip often is not the same. The real libraries are often highly proprietary. Um, when I was involved in, in uh, Novel E, usually at least you knew, if you were designing a chip, you knew it was on your chip. That's not true anymore either. In many cases, a single chip is, represents what used to be an entire integrated circuit board. And, may, and so a chip may have different components from different manufacturers. And the other folks don't know what, there isn't any one person who knows everything about that chip. In fact, they're not allowed to legally know what's on the chip. That makes it really, really difficult. Uh, another interesting problem is uh, quantum uh, effect error corrections. Um, some modern chips have just, it kind of blows my mind, the <laughs> scale of these things now. Um, again, you're, I guess I've been around too long. Uh, but uh, when, I, when I was involved, uh, when I was in the double E, uh, here, when I got my double E degree, um, they didn't have the kind of scales they deal with now. In order to produce chips at the highest densities, you typically have to go in and correct for quantum effects. That's pretty amazing that that's even a problem. But unfortunately, those techniques for countering it are considered proprietary by the manufacturer, and they believe simply looking and seeing what they're doing to your chip is proprietary, and you're not allowed, and so legally, you're not even allowed to see what's on your chip. That makes it really difficult legally to apply this. So there are definitely challenges to applying this on hardware. Um, that said, there's nothing that says it can't be done. And um, I think the issue as you go down lower and lower, it does become more difficult because your level of abstraction is very different from what you're tending to attack. It doesn't mean it can't be done, but it does make it more difficult. Um, and that at least gives me some hope that maybe it won't be quite as necessary in the hardware world. Oh, and finally, I should know, it only shows the chip under test is good. If I have two chips and I did DVC, I would, that would tell me about one chip. It doesn't tell me about the next chip. It's true for software, too, but it's easier to test the quality for software. I guess we have time for one more question, if there is any. Otherwise, uh, well, do now, I'm going to ask to ask the audience uh, and the candidate to step outside while the committee discusses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to leave. 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 I